The fifth and final stop of the O'Neill Coldwater Classic Series is held in the most prestigious of all the locations, Santa Cruz, California. The birthplace of cold water surfing and home of the inventor of the wetsuit, Jack O'Neill. It's the only spot you could really have the final of the cold water series. It was here that, you know, in 1952 where Jack went, right, I'm making a wetsuit and I'm going to surf longer than you are. I love Santa Cruz, you know, it's my favorite place in California for sure. It's mellow, you got skate parks, you got good waves, the people are cool and I love everything about it. It's cold and, you know, it's a beach oriented town too, which is cool because, um, a lot of cold places people don't really care for surfing. I think Santa Cruz is, is a, a mecca of surfing in California. It's non-stop action here. You know, whether you're watching the surf or you're, you know, driving your car down the main street, there's just something going on. It's just a, a really odd mix of people. People are just doing their own thing. You see naked people walking down the street, like, every once in a while, you're like, whoa, okay, these people are just out of their minds. What's that rabbit doing on my head? You don't find these type of characters anywhere in the world. Yeah, the Santa Cruz people are definitely different, but that's what makes, you know, Santa Cruz. That wave of the lane is a challenging wave, you know? It's got the backwash coming off the cliff, and you got the cliff right there. And... You're on the cliff, you know? Surfing right up to it. You're against all the elements. There's seaweed under there trying to knock you off, and there's seals out there trying yeah. to scare you, and great whites, and um, it's freezing cold, so it's definitely a tricky wave to surf, but when you get a good one, it's super fun. Where you take off, people are looking straight down on you. I guess it's the closest to being like a football player or something where you feel like you're in a stadium. I always look forward to this time of year when everybody comes to Santa Cruz for the cold water and having everybody here is special and uh, watching them surf your home spot and surfing with them out there is it's awesome, so I love it. The four previous events in the O'Neill Coldwater Classic Series has been a close-fought battle for the title of series champion. Stuart Kennedy won the first event in Tasmania to take an early lead in the rankings, only to be equal by South African Boyd and Bryson in Scotland. This means that the pressure was high leading into the third stop on the series in South Africa. Unfortunately, both surfers were knocked out in the early stages of the event, lessening the point gap on the leaderboard bringing surfers Sean Canstell and Dion Atkinson into play, who were third and fourth in the rankings respectively. Mysteriously, Boyd and Bryson, who was then ranked number one in the series, didn't attend the fourth event in Canada, which took him out of the running. Sean went on to advance to the semifinals in Canada, which moved him into pole position, but only by 200 points over Stuart Kennedy. Pretty happy to go up into the lead, and yeah, so hopefully I can keep a hold of that until the end of this event. You know, the question everybody wants to know here is, uh, how did this all get started? 
that goes back a long time. I was trying to work out how to keep warm. That water gets down below 50 degrees. And I would make some wetsuits and get laughed at. I was thinking I'm going to have a surf shop down at the beach and have a few friends and I never dreamed anything like this would happen. I think he has a pretty good uh, picture about how ubiquitous surfing has become due to his invention uh, or his innovations in the wetsuit world. But he opened a lot of those doors himself. He went to Australia, Japan, he went to Europe. We didn't have any money to put in for advertising, so we've always been very nice to the press, and they've been very nice. To you. <laughs> Unbelievable guy, and just such an honor to meet him and be here today, and uh, to see where the company's come from and, and gone is unbelievable, and uh, yeah, just really happy to be a part of it. Jack's always been magnanimous, and some of the Sea Odyssey uh, events are really great for the kids to learn ocean preservation and ocean safety. We teach them that the ocean is alive and we've got to take care of it. The Sea Odyssey program has given an experience of a living ocean to over 50,000 kids already. A lot of them have been changed by that experience demonstrably. And I think that would be a, a legacy that he could feel really proud of and would be really satisfied that he was able to have that kind of effect uh, with a new generation. Well, Jack certainly fulfilled his life ambition as just to be a waterman and be around the ocean and care for the ocean and help others care for it. So he's, he's got my full respect. I mean, it's a, it's a world-class wave, you know? If it's, if it's going off, you know, there's gonna be some big turns and big scores, and it's pretty exciting for the spectators because it's so close in. I'm ready to rock, and I hope everybody's ready to roll. My favorite weather is uh, fall and winter. I hate summer with a passion where it makes me just want to leave and go somewhere cold, actually. I've probably watched every event for the last 20 years, and if I get a win ever in my QS career, then I'd, I'd like to do it here more than anywhere else. Such a crazy place, Santa Cruz. It's got this like insane wave. The guys on the west side, the lane locals, are a pretty hardcore bunch of dudes. And I mean, I've never had any problems with them, but you know, I wouldn't drop in. Having all the hometown support is so nice. All of my friends and uh, my family and stuff are down here watching. And um, yeah, it's always nice to do good in front of your home crowd.
It's a pretty amazing wave. I mean, so fun. It just draws down the line and you get a nice pocket. You get three or four, you know, great turns sort of thing. So such a great place to finish off this cold water series. Today is my birthday, my 18th birthday, and yeah, <laughs> stoked. Yeah, my mom, you know, she just brought me up surfing and skating. Like, we used to have a mini ramp in our yard when we were little. I had fun surfing, so I just wanted to teach it. It's natural, you just want to teach it to your kids so they can have fun too, you know? They helped me out a lot with skating and pushed me in my surfing. I've been skating like on and off for a while now since I was little. I think it helps a lot with our surfing because our park at home has like it has big hips and you can go up and like do tail grabs and stale fishes and melons and leans and stuff and can really apply that to your surfing. I don't really work on like my style too much or anything. I mean like I bought a camera and me and my brothers always film each other and stuff and I was just watching like some turns I'll be like I'll be surfing, I'll be like, oh that was the worst turn ever. And then we'll watch it again and I'll be like, oh it wasn't that bad, you know. I was going through like a growing stage for a little while. I just felt so awkward for like a year, like but now that I've like kind of grown, just try to make my surfing more powerful and work on the things that I'm weak in. I like seeing movies and then like trying to do what those guys do. You just want to do it bigger and better. And then it's just pushing, everyone's pushing the level higher and higher. He's always pretty much known since he was little what his dreams were and his goals were. So he's just keeping at it. And I'm really proud of him. You have to build yourself. You can't like rely on anybody else to help you like get to the top. But... There's like people helping in the background stuff, like my mom, you know, she's like done everything for me. I want to win a world title. I'd be like, I'd be so stoked to win a world title. It'd be like the best thing ever. Stop speaking English and speak the Queen's English, speak the American English. <laughs> we all and you all and them all. The battle for the title of O'Neill Coldwater Classic Series champion 2010 reached its climax here in Santa Cruz. Coming into the event, Sean Kansdell was in the lead, but only by 200 points in front of Stuart Kennedy, making every heat in the competition critical. Sean started off confidently, winning the round of 96 with a score of 11 points, but disaster struck when he was knocked in the round of 48. This opens up the competition for Stuart Kennedy. If Stewart can advance to the round of 16, he moves into pole position in the rankings. Ever the professional, Stewart comfortably wins the round of 96, but unfortunately narrowly missed out on advancing through to the round of 24 by only 0.54 of a point, meaning he was knocked from the competition and the dream was over for the young Australian. Sean can't relax yet though, this isn't over. There is still a chance for teammate Dion Atkinson to win the series. Placing well in all the previous events, Dion is not that far behind in the rankings. If Dion can get to the finals here in Santa Cruz, this gives him enough points to take the series. Dion attacks the waves in the rounds of 96, 48, and 24, putting Sean in a worrying position. It all came down to the round of 16, where Dion was up against Matt Wilkinson. The first part of the heat was slow, but Matt found a wave that suited and scored 6.83 to start things off. Dion quickly answered back with a score of 5.43, but couldn't really find any other opportunity to add much onto this score. Meaning that a rather depressed Dion was out of the competition, and an related Sean Kensdell was the O'Neill Coldwater Classic Series champion 2010. That was the longest day of my life. Oh, I'm so stoked. Yeah. <laughs> Better come on up and...
Quarterfinals time at Steamer Lane. And first in the water is local surfer Johnny Kraft, who has managed to fend off world-class competitors to keep himself in the competition from the qualifiers. Not an easy task. Unfortunately, it was another lane local, Nat Young, that finally put an end to Johnny's glorious run. Nat won the heat with style and moved through to the semifinals. Next up is the man that ended Dion's dream of winning the series in the round of 16, Matt Wilkinson. Matt is up against the Hawaiian Mason Ho. Mason surfed well in the heat, but it was Matt Wilkinson that dominated, snapping his way through the right-hand break and into the semis. In heat three of the quarterfinals, Tonino Benson goes up against the winner of last year's event here in California, Nathan Yeomans. Tonino has family here in Santa Cruz who turned out in force to support the young Hawaiian. Even though Nathan is a tough competitor, Tonino didn't let his fan club down and comfortably beats Nathan, earning his place in the semifinals. The final heat of the quarter saw Australian Adam Robertson against New Zealander Billy Stairman. Adam didn't really find much opportunity to put many points on the scoreboard, but Billy chose his waves well and scored an impressive 13.5, putting him through to the semifinals here at Steamer Lane. My name is Jimbo Phillips. I am an artist, graphic artist, skateboard graphics, surf art, um, rock posters. My father is a well-known artist as well. He's uh, created a lot of iconic art and graphics over the years. He did the Santa Cruz logo, which is pretty, pretty famous, and the uh, screaming hand. Well, I'm very proud of Jimbo, and he's, his graphics are really great, and he's what I consider the, the wave master. He draws the gnarly grinding tubes. The art represents Santa Cruz to a good extent, but it's also kind of a Phillips tradition of the style. I learned from my dad, so uh, I acquired a lot of his techniques and style in my style. A lot of bright colors and bold lines. Well, Jimbo's art, you know, involves a lot of humor, and I really like that, and that's something that you can't train somebody to do. You just gotta come from inside, and some of his stuff really cracks me up. I get inspired by a lot of things. I'm inspired by music and surfing and skating, obviously. Sometimes if I don't feel inspired, I'll go surf or go skateboarding, get out there and enjoy the world a little bit, come back and hunker down. <laughs> I was really excited to get the call to create the Cold Water Classic poster, but at the same time, you know, it's like I wanted it to be really good, and uh, there was a lot of things we kind of wanted to um, incorporate into the poster. We tried to encapsulate kind of the whole Cold Water Classic vibe. Of course, you had to have some insane waves coming through the lane, but also the lighthouse. We've got some uh, some of the team riders in there. We got Nat Young, we got Rap Boy, we got Jordy Smith, Timmy Reyes. It was, it was really fun to work on, and I'm pretty stoked on how it came out. In the first heat of the semifinals is Australian Matt Wilkinson against one of Steamer Lane's most formidable locals, Nat Young. Finding only a couple of decent waves on his local break during this heat, Nat really didn't perform to his full capability, only achieving a low score of 5.44, leaving the door wide open for Matt Wilkinson. Matt seized this opportunity and put in a decent performance to score him a total of nine points. Not an amazing score, but more than enough to put him through to the finals 
and knocking a devastated Nat Young out of the competition. It's fair to say that New Zealander Billy Stearman had a shocker in the second heat of the semifinals, only scoring a paltry 4.4, meaning that he practically gift wrapped the last place in the finals for the Hawaiian Tonino Benson. With the highest score in the semifinals of 12.17, Tonino put on a great show for the dedicated spectators and for his family and friends here at the lane, who despite the dismal conditions were in very high spirits about Tonino moving through to the finals. This is it then, finals time at Steamer Lane, where Australian Matt Wilkinson is against the young Hawaiian Tonino Benson. A determined and motivated Tonino really made the most of the small swell conditions during the finals and clocked up a good score of 12.53 for his top two waves which really put the pressure on Matt Wilkinson to deliver. Matt has had a fairly easy ride up into the finals, but he really proves his worth during this close battle of the heat. Only picking the best of the bad conditions and performing to a high level on every wave, he scores a 13.67, beating Tonino's score by just over a point. This means that Matt takes the win here at Steamer Lane, entitling him to the prestigious title of O'Neill Coldwater Classic California Champion of 2010. Success for the Australian, but a broken dream for the Hawaiian, Tonino Benson, who takes second place. Breaking dreams all day and made my own dreams in the meantime, so I'm pretty happy. Having battled the raw elements against tough competition at all five stops in the series, Sean Cansdell emerged triumphantly here in Santa Cruz as the O'Neill Coldwater Classic Series champion 2010, earning him $50,000. The series has been a, a tough series, you know, like everybody's been surfing incredible. It's pretty hard to, you know, comprehend that I've actually won, you know, like it's it's going to take a while, probably. <laughs> this glorious victory concludes the O'Neill Coldwater Classic Series 2010. Join us in 2011, where the first stop on the series will be New Zealand. Everybody loves the Coldwater Classic Series. It's, it's so unique, it's so different. Um, and I think it kind of makes us all feel like we're warriors or something, you know?
we come to these events and we rug up and you know we surf big powerful waves and there's sharks and lions and it's like man versus wild you know you're against the elements the competitors know that when they come you know, over for the Coldwater Classic where it be in Tasmania and Scotland and Canada and California and South Africa you know they're not coming for a normal contest they're coming for to battle the elements and to claim a pretty unique prize at the end of the day great to be back in Cape Town. It feels a few degrees colder than last year, but um, oh, it's awesome. Such a nice place, so picturesque. It's just the most rugged coastline I've ever seen in the world, and I mean, the waves, there's crazy setups, there's big mountains of kelp coming out at you when you're surfing, there's just stuff going on everywhere. We're right at the tip of Africa, and We've got one of the biggest swell windows in the world. There's so many different kinds of waves that you can surf in this peninsula, it's, it's radical. But they are core and yeah, it's not for your faint-hearted kind of surfer. You know? the, the elements aren't on your side necessarily. It's not uh, always sunny and warm like it is today. It can get very cold and yeah, that ocean can get intense. No, nah, no boobs and board shorts, that's for sure. It's definitely uh, wetsuits and kelp. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all right though, you know, you've got to kind of adapt to the surrounding and um, you know there's nothing that beats a hot chocolate after you come out of the water that's for sure. There's so much animal life and there's so much fauna and flora and there's so much intensity with the weather and the elements that you know to get all that into one little space is pretty unique and that's what makes this place so special. That element of a little bit of fear in Cape Town never leaves you because you know there's some big fish swimming around there and it's got an edge to it, but it's a beautiful raw edge. The series got off to a rapturous start at the most southern location, Tasmania. In perfect conditions, Australian Stuart Kennedy claimed victory and secured an early lead in the battle for series champion. The series then moved on to the second and most northern stop, Thurzo, Scotland. Scotland this year was bitterly cold. We even had snow, which is sort of, you know, the first time ever, I think, in an ASP event that it snowed, and it was amazing. Ten days before that Scottish contest, I didn't do too much surfing. I was here in Cape Town, and I kind of relaxed, And because when you get to Scotland, it's cold, it's miserable, and you actually you don't want to get in the water. So I kind of starved myself of surfing before I went to that event, and, yeah, I think that worked in my favour at the end of the day, you know? Lord Royden Bryson's victory at the Scotland event puts him joint first with Stuart Kennedy on the O'Neill Coldwater Classic leaderboard, making the event here in Cape Town all the more crucial for the two surfers. It's just kind of strange that it's it's, it's neck and neck like that. So it's going to make it interesting, but um, oh, this is my home, so I don't see why it should be better than me, yeah. <laughs> Jordy Smith, currently sitting in the number one spot of the ASP rankings, doesn't plan to make it easy for them, though. I think Royden and Stu are going to be looking the most to win it. Um, you know, they got 50 grand up for grabs, so they're going to be going for the win. But uh, yeah, I mean, I just to throw a spanner in the works, make them work hard for it. Sunny morning. We're down here at Nordok for the first day of the event, and um, I just unpacked my boards and found that my friends at the airline have done me a little mischief.
South Africa has always had a presence on the international surf scene, but with a string of high-profile successes across various disciplines in 2010, the country has really shown its true colours. It's not easy being a sportsman from South Africa, you know, it's costly and it's, um, it's a long way to travel, so the kids have got to be committed. There's a real group of young kids, you know, that are pushing each other all the time. Kids like Brendan Gibbons and the, the Brand Boys. I mean, this is just some really, really good talent coming out of here. You take the local crew of big wave surfers in Cape Town, they are as core as any crew of surfers you'll find anywhere in the world. Where we're standing right here, this is like where I started, you know, learning how to surf bigger waves. And even though I got really scared and probably burst into tears a couple of times, uh, you know, this is where it all started. For 11 years, Chris has pursued his dream of winning the legendary Mavericks Big Wave competition in California. In 2010, he realized his dream amongst the treacherous 50-foot waves. Sometimes if you set your mind on something and you really believe in something, if you, if you stay focused long enough, you know, you'll, you will achieve your dreams if you're determined enough to get there. The meteoric rise of Jordy Smith has taken the global surf scene by storm. And the young South African is playing an integral part in progressing the sport into a new era. Geordie's such a good thing for South Africa. You know, it's really shown the young kids coming up, you know, that you can make a good living out of surfing. And, uh, and he's, you know, he's a very sort of inspirational guy. And, and um, he's really blown surfing up to the mainstream in South Africa. 2010 is proving to be Geordie's most successful year to date especially right here in South Africa. Having won the five-star QS event, Mr. Price by Lido Pro in early July, he then went straight on to win the Billabong Championship Tour event at Jeffrey's Bay. It's every South African surfer's dream to win J-Bay, so um, words don't explain how my feelings were going that day, you know, so emotional and um, one that I'll remember forever. These two victories on home soil put Geordie in the number one spot in the ASP World Rankings for the first time. It's crazy to see myself go from, you know, just a young kid to world number one. It's kind of trippy, you know, friends always ask, like, hey, what's it feel like? What's it feel like? And uh, it doesn't feel any different from being number two, <laughs> but uh, I guess it hasn't sunk in yet. Not content just yet, Jordy traveled down to Cape Town to compete in the Cold Water Classic in pursuit of another win to round off the South African trio of events. My mission would have been complete if I, if I win this, so uh, that'll be good. As South Africans, we've never had a presence as strong as we do at the moment, like on the international surfing scene. There's just been one success just after the next, and we just really have been keep up the momentum. The contest is postponed for at least an hour. We're going to make another call. We might just be waiting for the tide and the wind to drop off a little. Day two of competition was held in trying eight to 10 foot conditions at Outer Calm that tested even the most experienced of surfers. Australian Stuart Kennedy struggled with the conditions and placed third in his heat in the round of 64. This result knocks him from the event and gives the South African Royden Bryson the opportunity to take the lead in the Coldwater Classic rankings. Pretty stoked that this guy 50 grand to Royden Bryson. The Basque surfer Indar Perez, who knocked out Stuart with his last wave of the heat, was unremorseful about the Australian's loss. This is a competition, no? I can't look there, oh, Stuart Kenny is first in the ranking. No, no, I in my heat, I go to win. No, it's not my problem. <laughs> It seemed that on days like these in Outer Calm, local knowledge is key as the Brand Brothers showed the spectators how it was done. Surf here a lot at Outer Calm and yeah, practice here a lot and it's a really fun wave. Benji Brand, 13 or 14 and he is the most committed out here. Good stuff.
So the comp's over for the day. I've grabbed the boys, Quinton, Casey, Sean, and Dion, and we're gonna go up the top of Table Mountain, one of the seven wonders of the world, and check the view out. Let's go have a look. Sean and um, Dion were both shaking in the cable car, which was pretty funny to watch. When we got, we started coming up the steep part, and I was like hugging Dion. I was just like, blah, 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 and my legs were going all jelly, but it was, it was crazy. And I was looking back, and I could see Sean Gansler was had a, he, he was also fighting it a bit. You know, my hands were going all sweaty, and my knees are shaking, and yeah, I was pretty stoked to get up onto you know solid ground. <laughs> this is wild. I could never even imagine of being in a place like this. Nothing like a good coulee. It's amazing up here. It's a beautiful afternoon. Unbelievable view and so glad that I've found the time to get up here and check it all out because it's definitely worth it. There's Komaki. So we're here. And there's Komaki. It's such a beautiful city. Um, it's incredible, like the mountains right onto the, into the ocean. Is that a yep. left-hand point right near the stadium? It just feels like wild, like to these mountains all around. It's just all the time I'm looking around going, wow, check these mountains and look at this, look at that. <laughs> you made it. You made it. <laughs> look at the clouds coming over the mountains. In the future, I would love to take my child up there. I mean, I guess this just ticks another box on, you know, another one of our adventures on the Coldwater series. Dan, you want a Facebook profile pic? Yeah, tourist. I'll definitely be voting. This is one of the seven wonders of the world. Currently holding the number one spot in the ASP rankings, Jordy Smith was a major attraction for the locals of Kamiki. The South African superstar won his heat in the round of 64, but was knocked out of the competition in the round of 32 by local Matt Bromley, which ended Jordy's chances of taking his third consecutive win in under a month. Coming into the event, Stuart Kennedy and Royden Bryson were ranked joint first in the series. But with Stuart Kennedy being knocked out earlier in the competition, Royden Bryson had the opportunity to clock up some much needed points to move into the lead. The Cape Town local got off to a good start and progressed through to the round of 32, but was then frustratingly knocked out by Simon Fish and Antonio Bortoletto later in the day. We're so frustrated today. Eh? Well done to Simon and Antonio for getting through. So happy for them. <laughs> this development has made the series very interesting for Sean Kamsdell, who is currently ranked third. If the Australian does well here, there's a strong chance he could catch up with Stewart and Warden in the battle for series champion. Day four of competition saw the event back at Long Beach for the quarterfinals. The first heat saw the Australian, Dion Atkinson, against Chad Detroit. 
Even though he was suffering from flu, Dion really found a groove in these conditions. And with his signature snappy backhand turns, he secured himself a place in the city finals with a score of 12.33, knocking the South African Chad Natois from the competition. and Frankie Oberholzer is up against Sean Jobert. Sean put up a good fight, but the young South African couldn't quite find the waves he was looking for and only managed a 5.33 on his highest scoring wave. With an overall total of 8.33, this made Frankie Oberholzer's job a little easier. Third heat of the quarter saw Sean Kenstell against the South African veteran, Greg Epson. No one can say that Sean didn't put in the effort, but today just wasn't his day. The Australian went for all the wrong waves and only managed to put together a total score of 7.17 in the heat. Greg Emsley played the heat strategically though, paddling all over the break until a set came in, then moving into position at the last moment. With this strategy and local knowledge, he caught some of the best waves of the heat, which gave him a score of 12.1 and put him through to the semifinals. The fourth and final heat saw the two South Africans, Antonio Bortoletto and Daniel Redmond, battle it out for the last place of the semis. Daniel found some great waves and even managed to get some air time to score a total of 11.16. Antonio showed diversity, taking left and right breaking waves, which must have been favorable to the judges as he scores an 11.33 and progresses to the semifinals. The first round of the semifinal sees Frankie Oberholzer up against an under the weather Dion Atkinson. Frankie never really found his groove during this heat and only caught a couple of waves that didn't score him well. Frankie managed to keep things exciting though by nearly running over the water cameraman Larry Haynes. Thankfully, Larry was okay. Even though Dion was feeling rough, he was surfing really well and clocked up a decent score of 12 points in the heat. <laughs> cool. My throat's not too good, but I keep getting some waves and my board's feeling really good, so um, yeah, I keep making heats. I'm stoked to be in the final. Heat two of the semifinals, and Greg Emsley and Antonio Bortoletto are fighting for the last spot in the finals. Antonio surfed well on the two waves he caught during the heat, but it wasn't up to his usual standard, and the judges knew it, only scoring him 11 points. The focused and tenacious South African Greg Emsley pounced on this opportunity and gave it his best shot, powering through turns with gritted determination. Yeah, I'm sure the crowd will want a South African to win, so um, hopefully I can pull it off for the boys. Greg scores a respectable total of 13.27, putting him through to the finals against Australian Dion Atkinson. It's the perfect trophy for South Africa. 
With the shield comes a knopkiri, which you pull out, which is an African symbol of a, of a true warrior. He has a shield and he has a knopkiri and he goes into battle. I think it's a, a phenomenal symbol for what Africa is about, you know, battling the elements, you know, battling the ocean, battling your competitors and coming out as a warrior. Cold Water Series trophies are so prestigious and I mean I'd love to get my hands on one. Obviously they're banking on a South African to win it because there's no way they're going to let that thing through customs. Finals time and the two rival nations meet Australia versus South Africa. Fighting through the fever, Dion Atkinson opened up the heat with a high scoring seven points for his first wave, really putting the pressure on Greg. All Dion needed to do was maintain his lead. But even though he found a couple of great left hand waves to showcase his snappy backhand turns in the pocket, Dion couldn't find the killer blow. Dion scored a combined total of 12.17 for his top two waves. In front of a big local crowd, Greg Emsley was under pressure. With a decent score of 12.17 to beat, this wasn't going to be easy. Greg never lost hope as he caught wave after wave trying to better the Australian score. His persistence paid off as he scored 6.17 for a wave halfway through the 30 minute heat and a 7.83 for a wave in the dying seconds of the heat giving him an overall score of 14 points, making him the winner of the Cold Water Classic here in South Africa. Yeah! Ladies and gentlemen, the O'Neill Cold Water Classic winner, Craig Emsley from South Africa. Emsley, you beauty. Geordie's won the other two local events. I won the other one. I was thinking to myself, well, you know, I beat Jordy in this event, now I can't let the guy down and lose the final. We've got to keep it, keep all the trophies at home, so I'm stoked I managed to do that. What a year South Africa is having. Comprising some of the coldest, most demanding and challenging events on the WQS, the inception of the O'Neill Cold Water Classic Series in 2009 saw the birth of a new era in competitive surfing. I think the Cold Water Series 2009 was a huge success. Across the board of all the WQS events, we definitely had the best waves, the most challenging conditions and something completely different to the rest of the tour. It's highlighted the fact that surfing isn't just palm trees, perfect reef breaks, you know, tropical waters. It's really cool just to chase the winter and chase all them raw ocean swells and, yeah, have fun with it. All these events have been hard, challenging conditions and it tests your, like, strength and willpower against the ocean. Definitely makes you, like, have to take your surfing to a different level. And that's one of the great things about these events. They're in such a remote and different locations that, you know, there's places I've never been. Like, I never went to, been to Canada until last year. This year will be my first time in Scotland. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to that, you know, just going somewhere different, you know. 
there's 50 grand up for grabs and that cold water series champion sort of thing too. It kind of would change your life. Missing out on the title of series champion by only a fraction of a point in 2009, Jared Howes is optimistic about his chances this year. The Australian O'Neill rider is looking for a good start at the first and most southern stop on the O'Neill Coldwater Series 2010. I mean, I've had quite a bit of time to reflect on last year's, you know, defeat and, you know, I guess the thing that I got out of it the most is I just really want to win it now. You know, I want to have a great start down here in Tasmania and I want to be the cold water champion for 2010. To come down here, a bit more rugged weather, it's a, it's a good change and um, we've got a bit of swell so it's fun. Yeah, it's great just to be here and it's such a cool vibe in this little town. Good to see some green around everywhere again, and uh, yeah, I can't wait to get out in the water and have some fun. The ocean down here is just so powerful and raw. One day you're surfing a small wave, and the next day you, you know you push to your limit. There's bigger, powerful waves as you you know you could ever imagine. You can see behind me. It's, it's not. Uh, it's not easy out there. <laughs> the local guys are just. You know, they're really low key, really friendly. They. You know, they love tourists coming into their town. We just came from a place where there was people everywhere, and it kind of drives you crazy sometimes. You know. Is everything speed, speed, speed? It's surprising how much you get done by taking your time and doing it instead of rushing, rip and tear and have to go and do it again. The whole community's mobilised, they know what to expect. Had a blast last year, so I thought, well, I'll definitely be back this year. It's actually refreshing not being able to use your mobile phone and not being able to you know, get on the internet, get on Facebook in the afternoons. You can just kick back and do your own thing. It sort of brings all the competitors together because you're all travelling together, you're staying in close quarters, you're all going through the same thing, and you all got to help each other out until you get out in the water, and then it's dog eat dog again. <laughs>
this year in Tassie, I decided to sort of get back to nature. I thought I'd camp this year, so I've got a 4x4 camper van. When I come to these events, I just get this, you know, unreal feeling when I'm packing my bag. I know that I'm going to, you know, not necessarily camp, but sort of just get back to why I started surfing. Pretty much what I used to do with my dad and my brother and my family when we, you know, we used to go on camping holidays to remote places of South Australia. Campfires, starry nights, you know, I don't know, there's just something so rad about that exploration and, and cruisiness, I guess, of why I love surfing and why I'll surf forever. Um, well, I've got Earl Grey and green tea, you know. Maybe at night, just before bed, have a green tea. And then I've got the jet fuel for right now. Unfortunately, Jared was knocked out of the competition during his first heat and missed out on badly needed series points. But this meant he had more time to free surf, hang out and support his friends at the event. Jared Howes is just sort of one of my really good mates. <laughs> He grew up four houses up from me, so I sort of, he used him as a bit of a mentor and he sort of showed me how to become a pro surfer as well. and uh, Mark Matthews. It's been good and some highs with those guys. I've travelled all around the world, surfed all different waves, and you'd think I'd start to get over it by now, but, you know, it just gets stronger every, every year. It's like, now I feel like I'm running out of time and I just want to surf even more waves. I'm just getting my little fix of tennis right here. I used to have a Nintendo 64 when I was like five, and I think it's before that. Definitely old school, but they're pretty fun. There's not a lot of events in cold water, um, even on CT, so, uh, you know, it, it's just all about being well-rounded. I'm in for the whole series, so um, they'll see me around. <laughs> A local delicacy of the area is abalone, which can be found in abundance around the shores of Marawar, Tasmania. Sam Lamaroy and Jared Howes met up with Zeb Critchlow for an introduction into abalone diving. I'm a second generation abalone diver. Today we're going to go uh, diving for abalone. We're going to go uh, chip a few off the rocks, take them home, cook them up, throw them on the barbie. This is the shell. These are the breathing holes through here and they'll sit on top of the rocks like that. Just sneak up, knife underneath and... You gotta have a little bit something funny upstairs to be able to keep yourself underwater in such extreme conditions, I reckon. Some gloves. That's the abalone. Say, you 
Thank you. That's fine. Sick. Back at the event, one lucky young spectator had a unique encounter with one of surfing's Hawaiian legends. He just gave me his board for free. I'm an old guy, just having fun, you know, enjoying surfing against the younger guys. You know, if I win, I, geez, it's icing on the cake, and if I don't win, gee, the guy, the younger guys, they should have beat me in the first place. He's got a homeless person waxing his board. Piece of cake, I want my piece of cake now. You know, it's always the plan to be number one, but, uh, you know, I am still kind of a rookie, so i got a lot of things to learn. It's definitely the sport that you can't get too big at it, because the minute you do, you know, Mother Nature just kind of shuts you down. Cross my teeth with my eyes just to comprehend. Send a letter to a stranger, no, instead of my friend. Got a weak disposition, no, that just won't break. My goal is to win every event I enter. It doesn't happen. I, I wish it did. I just sometimes I'm a little I'm a clown out there in my heats and make mistakes. I love the water when it's cool and you're wearing a wetsuit. I don't know, just maybe because I grew up in a wetsuit, just what I'm used to. But there's a limit, you know. I don't like it when it's freezing. It's really only a nickname. John Kennedy Jr. They called him John John, so I just started calling him John John. His name is John. Yeah, I love free surfing and just going on surf trips just to surf. But then if I don't do a contest for a while, I kind of start to get antsy and I want to do one really bad. Robin's better watch yourselves, mate. I'm feeling good. I'm fit as, just as fit as them, probably fitter. And, you know, they can say what they want, but you know what? Papa Davidson will always come back and smash them if they don't look out. Here we are at Red Park Primary School, just out of Marawa, where there's 25 young kids waiting to hear what we got to say. They're gonna be pretty happy with all the goodies we've got for them, I think. This was the park, huh? My name's Jared. And I'm Sam. Hi. Um, how much training do you have to do until you get really good? That's a good question. <laughs> so much. For me personally, it's the most difficult thing I've ever done. And um, what if what if sharks away on you? Pardon? What if sharks sharks away on you? What if sharks surround you? If they surround you, you're fine. It's when they start eating you that you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Last year when I was in Cape Town in South Africa though, I hopped in a cage and swam with white pointers, big ones. Now you hear the noise actually before you see a shark. You do, you start hearing that. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so if you hear that noise, go in. Yeah. Quickly. Should we do it like a lucky dip? Well, we'll yeah. Grab something that you like. Right. We've got some beanies. Keep your head warm. Well, it's the last day of the event window, finals day. We're down to the quarterfinals. We're going down to the Lighthouse Beach. We've, we've been there for the majority of the event, really. It's been very good every day. It's the best it's looked this week. Um, it's looking really pretty, really nice out there. It's just ruler edge swell. It's had an offshore wind on it all night, so it's, it's looking really good. Couldn't ask for more for, for the final day, really. Quarter finals time at Lighthouse Beach, and in heat one, Royden Bryson is up against Marco Giorgi. 
The South African Royden Bryson surfed well in his heat, but it just wasn't enough to take down Georgi. The surfer from Uruguay had an incredible command over the waves, and this performance put him comfortably through to the semi-finals. Heat 2 was an all-Australian affair. Jake Sharp put on an impressive display throughout the event here in Tasmania, and this heat was no exception. But it was the surfer from Lennox Head, Stuart Kennedy, that dominated this heat with a couple of long, stylish rides, which scored well with the judges. Stuart Kennedy advanced through to the semi-finals. Heat three, and New Zealander Richard Christie is up against Australian Chris Davidson. Richard found his groove on a couple of great waves, but it just wasn't enough to beat XCT surfer Chris Davidson. The charismatic Australian powered his way through turns and went through to the semis. <laughs> 17-year-old Maxim Husenot came up against Wiggly Dantas in the last heat of the quarterfinals. Maxime from Reunion Island was in great form during his heat and clocked up a respectable score. But it was the Brazilian Wiggly Dantas that earned his position in the semi-finals with a snappy backhand performance on his top two scoring waves. <laughs> Could I have a Mars bar toasty? Mars bar toasty? He wants a Mars bar and a toasted sandwich. Thank you. And when he asked for it, we looked at each other and said, it can't be for real. Thought he was nuts. <laughs> Got to be lengthways like that, apparently. Butter on the outside. In the sandwich maker. He's come back this year, 12 months later, and he's had another one. Here we go, Sam, your Mars Bar sandwich. Oh. Mm. Now, the Mars Bar kid, the Sam. <laughs> With only four competitors left in the competition, the tension mounts for the semi finals at Lighthouse Beach. First heat of the semi sees ex-championship tour surfer Chris Davidson up against the Brazilian Wiggly Dantas. Chris put up a good fight in this heat, but came up short on the scoreboard, giving Wiggly Dantas the advantage. The Brazilian seized the opportunity and with a couple of solid scores, knocked Chris Davidson out of the competition and earned himself a place in the finals. Two of the semis saw the surfer from Uruguay, Marco Giorgi, battling for a place in the finals against the young Australian Stuart Kennedy. Marco caught a couple of great waves and his long, flowing, powerful turns went down well with the judges. But unfortunately, this was no match against Stuart Kennedy. The surfer from Lennox Head has been training hard recently and it has certainly paid off. Stewart was on form during his heat, even catching a great barrel. This great performance scores highly and puts him into the finals against Wiggly Dantas. Tasmanian tiger? No, I've never heard of that. 
think it's like a dog with like a tiger sort of stripes. Thing. I think we actually saw one last night. Uh, we were like feeding a chicken off the barbecue and stuff, but uh, it didn't come out and eat it. <laughs> I thought they were extinct. Finals time at Lighthouse Beach in Marawar, Tasmania. And finalists Wiggly Dantas and Stuart Kennedy prepare for the biggest heat of their competitive careers. Wiggly, who has been in superb form during the competition, delivered a good performance during the finals, but simply couldn't find the right waves in the 35-minute window to clock up a decent score. The Brazilian scored 12.57 overall. Come on, Stewie. This was the furthest he'd ever been when he made the round of 24. Yeah. Now he's in the final and possibly going to win it. I think this could be the greatest day of his life thus far. With an early lead of 9.5 on his first wave, Stewart's confidence was through the roof and the young Australian went on to score an 8.5 on his next wave, scoring him a total of 18 out of a possible 20. This was the highest scoring combination of the event, which emphatically gave Stuart Kennedy the win here in Tasmania. With his friends waiting to carry him to the podium, Stuart triumphantly takes home the $20,000 prize money and the coveted Tasmanian Tiger Trophy. The O'Neill Cold Water Classic Series 2010 got underway at the most southern location, Marawar, Tasmania. Tassie was great this year. I mean, I had such a good time there the year before. I was really looking forward to going back. And this year, with the whole camper van and kind of getting down to earth a little bit, um, I had an unreal time. 100 metre long right hand appealing for, for the guys on the last day. So. Yeah, I think everyone was thrilled to be back and surfing good waves. I don't know, I had a really good feeling at Tassie, so uh, I just had a really good routine and just stuck to it. I was really happy to get waves at the event and come out with the win on top. I think Stewie's definitely got what it takes to win the Coldwater Series, and um, I mean, I hope I win it, but um, if I didn't win it, yeah, it'd be great to see Stewie do it. The second and most northern stop brings the series to Thurso, Scotland for the fifth consecutive year. This event is one of the most unique and anticipated six-star events in the ASP calendar. Back in Scotland, and it's... I love it. Yeah, it's always nice to be back in Scotland, isn't it? I was actually trying to think, is Thurso the furthest English-speaking surf spot 
from Sydney. I think it could be close, you know? It took so long to get here. Being the fifth year of the event now, a lot of the surfers that have been coming here, whenever they come back, they always seem to have a smile on their face. Seems like every time I come here, I get to you know surf a new wave or explore another little part of the coast, and you know that's what I love about surfing, that sort of exploration and adventure. So this ticks all the boxes for me. Every year, because it's such a big event, you get a new crop of people who come here for the first time, and it's fantastic to watch their genuine amazement and their genuine enthusiasm. I'm staying with Nat Young this year. It's his first time to Scotland. His eyes are popping out of his head, you know. He can't believe that this castle's on the beach. I mean, I've never been anywhere like it, really. It seems like it, like you go back in time almost. Everything just seems so old, like, you know, there's like buildings that have been here for like hundreds of years. It's so crazy to me how it just like, it's still there. The ancestry here is, is forever long. I just think of people running around over big green hills and fighting with swords. These cities go way back, these little towns and buildings. So I mean, it's kind of like a cultural, historical discovery channel. <laughs> It's definitely the coldest here, and apparently it's the coldest it's been in 20 years. It feels like it's snow at night, and the water is definitely the coldest I've ever been in. Santa Cruz never gets this cold. The guys at home wear booties and 4.3s and hoods when it gets cold, but it's nothing like this. We'd never be able to surf this place if we didn't have a wetsuit, boots and gloves, you know. Like, I guess nobody surfed this place until after 1952 when Jack invented the wetsuit. We're on the grand tour of Akagao Castle. Staircases, empty rooms, creaky floorboards, and apparently a ghost. Let the hunt begin. Where does this go to? What's in there? From sort of afar, you, you don't really get the perspective. You're like, oh, there's a castle. And then you get right up next to it, and you look up, and it's so big. And I know the architecture and everything about it, it just really makes you go, right, I'm in Scotland, this is sick, this is awesome. Whoa, that chick's got a gun. Like looking at all these little letters and all the photos and stuff, it's really cool how they've kept it all original. Akagao Tower. Akagao Tower is a strong, impressive 15th century castle. The family had a long bit of feud with the local family, the Guns, and caught up in the murder and mayhem was Helen Gunn. She was seized and carried off to Akigao. The poor girl was imprisoned in an upstairs chamber, but rather than yield to Dunglad, threw herself off the tower and was killed. Her ghost, a green lady, is said to have been seen in the castle. There you go. It is haunted. 
I don't really believe in ghosts, but at night time in a scary castle like this, I might, so, <laughs> yeah. Love that you guys are just all sticking to each other's shoulders, eh? Hey? Everywhere here is kind of like, you kind of have the feeling like, is this place haunted? I'm not sure. What's in here? What? There is that, I'm gonna scare him. Casey was claiming he was gonna scare me the whole time, but I was a little bit ahead of him. <laughs> Jay, you were so bad, you left the door open. Pretty spectacular. A castle sitting sort of right on the water's edge and gets you thinking about what it would have been like being around in the 13, 1400s wielding a sword. I could go into battle with one of these. This thing looks like it's hit a couple of bones, eh? Hundreds of years ago, there were probably people out on the field right there, like sword fights and stuff like that, so it's pretty crazy to be sitting here right now. I feel like a king. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've never really been to a castle before, so. Yeah, it's unreal. I don't know, it's a weird sort of eerie feeling, but at the same time, you know, you go through this house or this castle and check it all out and just go, wow, this is rad. I'm in a huge piece of history right here. <laughs> Nat's an awesome little character. He's got like 10 different nicknames for me. My name went from Jared to Jerry, and then it went to Springer, and then his latest one, he's been calling me Springsuit. You know, like every time he opens his mouth, I'm like, wait, all right, what's the new nickname? I think Sean's one of those guys that lets his um, surfing do the talking. He's about 26, but he surfs like an 18 year old. He's just so amped. This is the coldest event in the world. You know, the water's so cold here and the, and the weather, I mean, it's freezing. Talk about snow coming this weekend. It's colder up north and that's what you gotta expect. This is kind of a bit of a tradition. All the Aussie boys usually get together. We try and round up as many crew as possible when it's flat or you know the event's on hold. And here we are. We've got about 18 guys, and um, we're about to play some soccer. Heads, heads. heads. Letting off some steam. Yeah. Um, no surf, cabin fever. Keeps everyone kind of moving around and not being lazy, so it's good. I'm on the, the bulk Australian, like, all Australian team, um, and then the other team is, like, half South African, half Aussie. I think there's probably more talent soccer-wise in, in Africa than there is in Australia, judging by watching this. Do something, Hammer! Yeah, Nichols out there, he's in goal, but he's a bit of a slug. Stewie's on my team, we're up front. <laughs> Side. It's an Aussie rule. 
I'm not good at kicking, but I figure I'm pretty good at stopping people, so I've just been hanging back. And being surfers, it's an individual sport, and so it's weird to play on the team, but um, you know, it's something we definitely miss, and I think that's why we enjoy it so much. You know, not that skilled, really. I'm sure we'll see a few people fall over. No one's got the right footwear on. He's in booties. Go booties! <laughs> There'll be some sore bodies tomorrow. I've heard a few people going, oh, I did this, I did that. But uh, no, nah, we're not injured really. It's just we don't run much. Surfing is like a box of chocolates. Sometimes they're like, they've got cream in them, sometimes like coffee cream. Like you don't know what you're gonna get. You can't tell from the outside because the stuff's inside. From the outside, it's just chocolate. My granddad was Scottish, so I've got a bit of Scottish in me. Freezing, like I got out the water and my fingers and my toes were just white. No blood. You could have chopped him off, I wouldn't have felt it. Start is nowhere. <laughs> yeah. I never see snow before, you know. I thought it was rain, and then the snow, snowflakes start to come into my eyes, and then the guy in white just look at me and say, "It's snowing." I say, "What, man? That's crazy, man!" I start to laugh. Proper snow paling out. Little big flakes of snow coming down like it's amazing, it's beautiful. <laughs> Never in my entire life, not in my 18 years of surfing have I ever surfed in snow before, you know, so yeah, it's something radical, something new, something different. Had a little dance in the in the snow. <laughs> I've never seen snow before, so it's pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, that was a memorable heat for sure. I've I'll remember that forever. That'll be the heat that I'll be telling when I'm down the pub when I'm old. Wow, it's gonna be forever in my mind, man. I'm gonna tell my daughter when I go back home. Yeah, it's a moment to remember. It's something we won't forget. It'll probably only happen once in your life. Quarterfinals time at a freezing cold Thurso East. The quarters are made up of four 30 minute heats where two surfers go head to head and only the two highest wave scores from each surfer count. First heat and Nathaniel Curran is up against Royden Bryson. 
Nathaniel, who served consistently well throughout the competition, couldn't quite get the edge on the goofy-footed South Africa. Royden put on an effortless display of his surfing ability, which progressed him through to the semi-finals. Heat 2 sees Sean Cansdell up against Australian-born Irishman Glenn Hall. Glenn is no stranger to the top eight in the Cold Water Classic series, and with his snappy style of surfing, it's easy to see why. But today wasn't to be Glenn's day, as Sean Cansdell dominated this heat to progress through to the semi-finals. On to heat three, and it's Frenchman Marc Lacomere versus Brazilian Yuri Sodre. Mark's fluid style during this heat was impressive, but the judges gave preference to the Brazilian powerhouse's solid style. Yuri Sodre moves through to the semi-finals and closer to winning the coveted Claymore Sword. Tonight you can't let floor. Having won the event in Tasmania and progressing through to the quarterfinals here in Scotland, it would be fair to say that Stuart Kennedy is doing very well in the series so far. So getting knocked out by Rayoni Montero in heat three of these quarters isn't such a big disappointment to the Australian. But the Brazilian Rayoni couldn't be happier about moving through to the semi-finals, giving him the opportunity to win the most iconic trophy in professional surfing. Of which I'm just not sure. That thing's so cool again. That's like the best trophy on the whole tour. By far the best trophy in professional surfing. I mean, what man doesn't want to have a sword on his wall, you know? You just want to feel it. I put my hand on that thing. Oh my god! That'd be pretty cool hanging in your in your room. Yeah. Oh, it feels good, eh? You reckon they'll let us take us on the plane with us? The sword's a fantastic trophy to have. It kind of symbolises Scotland and the freedom that we're constantly fighting for. One step closer to uh, you know, actually taking the sword home. So, hope we get there. I won it. <laughs> One more and in the final. I was so tired, now I feel my energy back. I want to go again. <laughs> Whoa! Whoever wins this is a warrior, and they receive a trophy fit for one of very esteemed standing amongst their peers. It's such an awesome trophy. Who wouldn't want it? Oh, that feels good. Are you teasing me? You better take this away from me, bro. <laughs> The morning of the semi-finals sees Thurso East covered in a dusting of snow, which provides entertainment for the surfers from warmer climates. But for the four competitors left in the event, it's time to focus the mind. First heat of these semi-finals is an all-Brazilian affair. Rayoni Monteiro versus Yuri Sodre. Both exceptionally good surfers competing in great swell conditions. This was always going to be an exciting heat, but only one surfer can progress through to the finals. Even though Rayoni gave it his all, it wasn't quite enough. His competitor clocked up high scores with the judges for two near flawless waves. Yuri Sodre moves through to the finals with this exceptional performance. Second heat of the semi-finals sees Sean Cansdell up against Royden Bryson. Sean took a year off from competitive surfing last year, so this year he has renewed determination to stake his claim on valuable ASP ranking points. Attacking every wave as if it were his last, Sean's performance here in the semis was impressive, but it was the South African Royden Bryson's tenacious attitude and nimble style that caught the eye of the judges. 
scoring highly for two great waves, Royden progresses through to the finals. This isn't the first time Royden has been in the finals at a Cold Water Classic event, though. He narrowly lost out to series champion Blake Thornton in Cape Town in 2009. For the final day of the competition, the weather gods were smiling down with near-perfect swell conditions. And with 3,000 ASP ranking points, $20,000 and the best trophy in professional surfing up for grabs, it's a victory worth fighting for. Yuri Sodre is a solid and consistent surfer that never fails to impress. His performance here in Scotland is testament to that fact. Go, Yuri, go! But the final here in Scotland was more about strategy than performance. Yuri found it difficult to pick the right waves, and the Brazilians' efforts only scored him a total of 9.43, leaving Royden Bryce an ample opportunity to take the win. With support from his South African friends on the shoreline, Royden waited patiently for the right wave to come along. His patience paid off and Royden caught the best wave of the heat, scoring him an impressive 8.33. With a total score of 13.83, the South African claimed victory here at the most northern event in the Cold Water Classic series. Both finalists are given a plot of land in the Highlands and are officially made lords of their land. But with Lord Royden Bryson's triumphant win, he also lays claim to 3,000 ASP ranking points $20,000 and the coveted Claymore Sword Trophy. Royden Bryson, your 2010 O'Neill Cold Water Classic Scotland champion. Everything about coming to Canada is different, I guess. I never ever thought I'd come to Canada for a, a surf event. You know, I never even thought I'd probably come here on a holiday. It's got a rugged appeal, but I don't know, it almost brings just a different dimension to remote. I think to come up here and come to an event in Canada, it's, um, it's just another you know, awesome stop on the Cold Water Series. But that's, you know, that's what I love about it. I love sort of the natural feel to it and just the fact that there's, so there's not many people around. It's just sort of us and nature. It is a, a weird, you know, thing. People are going, are they, are they giant snowboards or are they big skis? You're like, no, they're surfboards. We're going to Vancouver Island to Tofino and then they kind of, I like, think a lot of people are like, oh yeah, yeah, we heard this surf there, you know, but you guys are mad, it's too cold. One of the things I love about the Cold Water Series, it seems like everywhere we go, we end up in a small community. You know, you get to know these people and, you know, they've got a big smile and they welcome you back the following year and it's no different in Tofino. If anything, it's probably like even a, a warmer sort of welcome back. 
The 2009 O'Neill Coldwater Classic event held in Tofino was the first ever ASP six-star competition to be held on Canadian shores and concluded with local underdog Pete DeVries defeating a slew of world-class competitors to claim victory. You know, I think last year what Pete DeVries did put Canada on the map. Having a local from Canada beat, you know, every American, Hawaiian, Brazilian, all those guys made a, a big impact on the surf community in Canada. I'm already getting goosebumps just thinking about it. It was just the best sporting uh, achievement from anyone to be, you know, you know, by miles. It was so great to have the whole community behind me. Everybody came down and there was so much support. I think they like put a full hex on everybody here. Like the Canadians are so nice, I think they secretly do voodoo behind you. If you're gonna surf against Pete DeVries, you gotta watch out. The chase for the title of O'Neill Coldwater Classic Series champion has been dramatic so far in 2010. It all started with Stuart Kennedy raising the bar in Tasmania with a convincing victory. He just never looked like losing. And uh, yeah, he went out there and he won that event and um, you know took the ratings lead straight up. The series then moved on to the most northern stop, Thurzo, Scotland, where the battle against the elements continued. Stewie finished fifth, and um, Royden Bryson sort of came from behind. I don't think anyone sort of saw him as the champ, you know, and then he just ripped that last day and took it out. So all of a sudden, the, the ratings lead was tied exactly. And then going into South Africa, Stewie went out first heat, you know, which was a huge exit, really. Royden had the chance to overtake me for sure in South Africa, being his hometown. He went down in the round of 48, I think, and, um, you know, didn't really put the lead he probably would have liked on him. Disappointingly, Ward and Bryson couldn't make it to the event here in Canada to preserve his lead in the rankings, leaving a much relieved Stuart Kennedy, perfect opportunity to move into the number one spot. Yeah, it's pretty cool that he didn't come for now, I guess. I think he's really jeopardized his chances of winning and opened the door for Stewie in second, Sean and Dion. So, I mean, those guys are rubbing their hands together, but um, I'm sure Royden's at home weeping. The definition of a waterman, I don't know, I guess, you know, somebody that spends a considerable amount of time on the water and, you know, really thrives in that environment. So, yeah, in that sense, I would consider myself a waterman because I grew up on the water. Living on a boat for a long time, you're surrounded by it, so it's, it's everything when, you know, it becomes, for lack of a better word, like a friend, you know. I always aspire to sing conscious music, you know, forward thinking, spiritual music in a sense. Music and the ocean to me are very connected. 
you know, they, there's, there's definitely a correlation between the two things. You know, because you could, you could sit down and listen to the wind blowing through the trees and the water lapping on the shore. And, you know, if, if you meditated on it long enough, you start to hear all kind of things. I mean, I know wave-wise, some of the best waves in the world are happening in the cold places, you know. I have ultimate respect for anyone who's brave enough to go into cold water. I did that for a few years, you know. Tried windsurfing in it, and it's, I don't know, I'm not into the numb thing, so, you know. <laughs> I'm just into complete surfing. You know, I don't want to be a guy who can just do airs. I don't want to be a guy who can't do an air and just does rail turns and gets barreled. So I'm, I'm into everything, you know. I'd say the more nerve wracking is, you know, you got all the locals, they come down for every one of your heats and they're expecting to see something special. So, you know, I don't want to go out there and bog and disappoint everyone. I can't say it enough, like the Canadian people are just so cool and so welcoming to us. This place is amazing, man. This event site is just sick. You're right here in the woods, just walk down through the trees for your heat and uh, you know, get on the beach and get amongst it. You know, the 50 grand's a, a, a great incentive to, you know, give it your 100%, 100% but um, having a family at home, it uh, makes it harder to go away, and when I'm away, I want to be doing as good as I possibly can. In terms of domination, it's always been the Aussies, it seems like. When you look at the top 10 names on the World Tour, it seems like seven of them are Aussie, you know, and it's just, it's hard to break because it's such a, a bigger sport there than even in the States. Japan is not well known for its surf breaks, but where there's a will, there's a way. Azuki Tanaka is proof of that will, and having won the 2009 Japanese Championships, this tenacious surfer is quickly coming up through the ranks. Azuki is proud to be one of the most prominent ambassadors for Japan's fledgling surf scene. サーフィン一緒に始めたのは夏は台風が来ればいい波ありますけど、普段は本当小さくて、ま、南の方の四国とか九州に行って河口でサーフィンすれば本当にいい波はありますけど、基本的にやっぱ波当てるのは難しいです
um, ripping, surfing great, and um, yeah, I think that you know if maybe Azuki did a few more events, you know, you'd really see him up there in the ratings. まだ浅いけど、本当こう人間性だったり、こうサーフィンを勉強するっていう意識がすごい高くて、本当もっと海外の選手に来てもらって、こう本当向上心を持ってこうやっていきたいと思ってるんで、本当こうサーフィンの日本のサーフィンの文化を盛り上げていきたいです。Yeah, Azuki is one of my favorite Japanese surfers for sure. I mean. There's a there's a good little crew over there, and I mean I know they all push push each other, and I mean it's nothing but smiles when you walk past them and say hello on the beach. They're the friendliest guys in the world, I find. Yeah, the Japanese are um, they're generally fairly skinny and small, are very light on their feet, really good in small waves, and really good you know progressive surfers. と日本一日でもこう世界のシリーズで戦えたり、顔ケースレーダーとか戦うことが本当夢でやってみたいです。本当サーフィンは人生で俺のパートナーっていうか相棒であって、これからもずっと続けていて本当大好きです。About coming to a spot like this until you actually see it on like a video or, or until you're actually here walking through a forest to go surfing. It's really nice not to get the smog and just breathe fresh air and go surfing. So much build up to these events and to the series, and you know everyone's counting down. In one more week, you know someone gets crowned the cold water champion, and no one knows what's going to happen in these next few weeks. Having completed four rounds of surfing, it is now time for the quarterfinals at North Testaments Beach in Tofino, which boasts a star-studded lineup. First in the water is New Zealander Richard Christie and Australian Josh Kerr. Josh found his groove in this heat and used the small waves to his advantage, boosting aerials wherever possible, scoring him 13.47 for his two best waves. 
Richard Christie tried to employ the same tactic, but it was Josh that read the waves a little better, advancing the Australian through to the semifinals. The second heat of the quarterfinals saw Glenn Hall up against Julian Wilson in a tight battle for a place in the semifinals. Glenn surfed well, finding opportunities for aerial maneuvers, but it was Julian Wilson who took the heat with a score of 12.26, bettering Glenn's score by only 1.09 points. Heat 3 was an All-American affair with Tanner Godaskis up against Eric Geiselman. Tanner made the best of the conditions, snapping through his top two waves on his backhand, scoring him 11.2. Eric Geiselman, who has performed to a high level throughout the event, only just managed to sneak past Tanner with a score of 11.33, putting a relieved Eric through to the semifinals. The last heat of the quarterfinals was more than just a battle between Nathaniel Curran and Sean Cansdell for the last place in the semifinals. Prior to this quarterfinal, Sean was ranked a well-earned second in the O'Neill Coldwater Classic Series. But by winning this pivotal heat against Nathaniel with a score of 14.3 means that he moves into the number one spot, knocking Stuart Kennedy into a close second. But with one more bet on the series, this race hasn't been won yet. Sean needs to at least advance through to the finals here in Canada to put a comfortable distance between him and Stewart on the leaderboard. Uh, there's still one more comp to go. He's only 200 points in front of me. Hopefully he gets knocked in this next seat. That's pretty exciting. It's going to come down to the wire, that's for sure. Here we go. Tofino, are you ready for this? In the first heat of the semifinals at North Chestermans was Josh Kerr against Julian Wilson. Julian, a progressive young surfer from Australia, put on a solid and impressive performance for the spectators on the beach, which scored him a respectable 11.17 points for his top two waves. heard Josh Kerr was having a great time in the semifinal heat, and it showed in his fluid and stylish surfing. The judges awarded Josh with an overall score of 12.64, which put him comfortably through to the finals. But in this cold water, you know, your, your heart's pumping, just trying to keep you warm, and that's what surfing's all about. Look at the raw energy, and everyone's on the beach having a good time. Second heat of the semifinal saw Eric Geiselman against Coldwater Classic Series leader Sean Cansdell. This was Sean's chance to add to his newly acquired lead over Stuart Kennedy, who was watching anxiously from the beach. Unfortunately, Sean only managed to score a 10.96 for his top two waves, leaving Eric with a great opportunity. It comes as no surprise that Eric is in the semifinals here in Tofino. He has surfed well throughout the event, and his performance in this heat is testament to that, with the highest overall score in the semifinals of 13.43. To seal the deal and securing himself a place in the finals, Eric pulls an aerial maneuver rarely seen in competition. Oh, um, that was uh, just that was a corrupt flip, actually. Uh, Josh Kerr's in the final too, so I kind of used his move. I felt confident I could pull it off if, if I got the grab right, and uh, yeah, lucked out and it worked out. The western shores of Vancouver Island have been home to the Neutral North First Nations for thousands of years. Having adapted to the unique surrounding, a hand-carved paddle proved to be their lifeline and in recent years has become symbolic of the area, making this a fitting trophy for the winner of the O'Neill Coldwater Classic Canada 2010.
finals time at North Chesterman's Beach, and the locals attend in force to Good watch luck, the drama man. unfold between the Australian Josh Kerr and the American Eric Geisel. Having used one of Josh Kerr's signature moves in the semifinals, it's time to see how he performs against the man himself. Sensing that the judges are scoring highly for aerial maneuvers, Eric tries to get airborne as much as possible. But his tactic didn't work out as well as planned, and Eric only scored an average 10.2 for his top two waves. Josh Kerr wasn't about to let this opportunity slip away. The tenacious Australian impressed the judges and scored 6.6 .6 for his first wave and 5.5 for his second, giving him an overall score of 12.1. This beats Eric's score by nearly two points, meaning Josh Kerr takes the win here at the O'Neill Coldwater Classic Canada 2010. Next time, where the O'Neill Coldwater Classic reaches the final event of the series, the home of Coldwater Surfing, Santa Cruz, California, where the title of series champion 2010 will be decided.